All right, so. I think as folks are coming back in, or if you didn't, uh, if you didn't have to step out and it kept it for you, that's awesome. I'm going to rename myself. Uh, How's everyone doing this uh, Tuesday afternoon? Good. That's the that's the dangerous question, the one that gets. Uh, <laughs> how it, I mean, it's just. 2020.2. <laughs> All right, yeah. All right. Um, so I'm just taking a look here to look for the agenda. We are recording, so Josie, anytime you want to start. We are recording, so Josie, anytime you want to start. Sure. Uh, so we are the Spending and Budget Subcommittee of the Northampton Police Review Commission. And uh, we are going to do roll call to make sure that everyone's here. And just so you know that this meeting is going to report uh, recorded. Uh, the recording can be found on Northampton Open Media on YouTube and other, I believe you can also find it on the website, the government website. Um, but yeah, if we could do roll call, um, anyone who wants to volunteer to do um, the actual roll call. So uh, Lois. Here. Uh, Dan here uh michael here and josie i am here awesome so let's get started i'm pulling up the um agenda now so the first thing that we have is the approval of meeting minutes move to approve we'll second it Did anyone um, changes to the meeting, uh, to the minutes that they needed to, that they wanted to discuss? It was for December 30th. Yep. I'm, I'm good. I'm right. good for approval. So we'll do a quick roll. And Noah, are you back all the way? I'm back. Thank you so much. I'm so right. glad everyone is still here. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, Lois? Yes. Dan? Yes. Michael? Yes. Josie? Yes. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Fantastic. So how do y'all want to start? Uh, oh, we have uh, 30 minutes of public comment, probably. Um, It was great. I had a lovely conversation with the person. Ooh, I think we're losing you, Josie. Okay. Um. I think Josie's going to come back um, on their phone. In the meantime, uh, we'll just be here for a second. <laughs> Hopefully, it won't take too long. Something must be in retrograde. It's the only, <laughs> the only explanation. <laughs> The Zoom gods are unhappy. Seriously, I'm like, okay. All right, there we go. Perfect. Hello. Hello. Hi, there's two of me now. I'll yep. leave my computer. That's fine. I'll just be on my phone tonight, I suppose. Um, yeah, that I've had classes early today, and my students were complaining about the same thing. I don't know what it is. Lately, uh, Zoom has not been functioning great for me. Um, but as I was saying, we have open uh, open comments for the first 30 minutes of this meeting. Uh, it's probably to give the public a chance to respond to our preliminary report um, that you gave, Dan, which I thought was fantastic uh, for the most part. 
Uh, I tuned in for a good majority of it. I was talking to a nice person on the YouTube comments during the live feed. Uh, and I, I thought it was great. I thought you answered a lot of their questions really well. Um, but we're going to open the floor for public comment 30 minutes. So we're going to stop at 615. Um, and yeah, so if anyone wants to give public comment, they're more than welcome to raise their hand and we can call on them and have you unmute. So if folks are looking for the raise hand uh, feature, it actually got moved underneath the um, reactions button instead of participants. Uh, I did not, I was not aware of that. Yep, just got moved. <laughs> um, so if, if somebody's looking to raise their hand, that's where it is now. So, if no one, how long, how long do you usually give people to think of if they want to raise their hand? It looks like uh, Richard Hendrick might want to speak. Uh, I guess I'm not able to see that on my phone. Uh, go ahead, uh, Richard. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the I saw the mic go up, but uh, okay. I guess we are um, commentless. <laughs> sure thing. Um, then I guess we will move on to the next portion of our meeting, which is further discussing further research and discussion on the data acquired on police in Northampton. Um, I will be honest, it's been a pretty busy week with progress reports today. Uh, for a second, completely forgot about this meeting until I received that email from Dan three minutes after it started. And so I want to say thanks for that. Greatly appreciate it because I can be here for this. Um, but I don't know about anyone else, but today I wanted to kind of do a deep dive into the policing contracts. I know a lot of it is, there's a good portion of it that is, um, kind of public record, but when I was looking at it last week, it was it was incredibly dense in terms of the type of language they were using. Um, I don't know if anyone else has gotten a chance to look at Massachusetts police uh, union contracts. I haven't looked at the state ones. I've only looked at the, um, and, and honestly not even all of the contracts for uh, Northampton have only looked at the patrol officers um, mm -hmm. in any real depth. Um, but I don't know if folks want to guide that or if there's like a leading question that we want to answer from within there. We are called the, the spending and contracts subcommittee. So I thought, um, you know, I might do us some good to at least put a little bit of contracts in there. Um, that being said, like, where do we, where do we stand in terms of what we are capable? Like, I know that our commission essentially has no teeth in terms of like being like, this happens now, right? Uh, it's mostly recommendations. And I, on, I'm obviously on the side of recommending, uh, as much as possible in order to kind of reimagine what policing looks like in Northampton. But what is... What is feasible? Like how against the policing contracts can we go? And I guess what kind of hot water does the municipality of Northampton get into if those contracts are broken? Is it like a payout? Is it like, I guess I'm, I just, this is, I will admit that this is an area where I, I lack uh, knowledge. I, I wonder, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure about uh, being in violation of a contract. I don't, 
Uh, I'm not really very clear, honestly, on the, okay. the police contract with the city right now, because uh, I would kind of assume it's similar to the way that the, that the city negotiates with the teachers union, uh, which would be maybe like three years at a time or something like that. So, you know, wouldn't necessarily be about breaking a contract as it might be, it might be about, you know, what is negotiating the contract, right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe if it's not, you know, again, it, 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 as we've kind of talked about, um, you know, a couple of times, thinking about the future, it might be saying, okay, in the next negotiations, we, we would recommend mm -hmm. X, you know, um, so, you know, as opposed to, to uh, not, not, you know, meeting the agreement that we're currently in, it might be more about how do we move forward. And so um, this, the current contract is uh, 2019 to 2022. Um, mm -hmm. So negotiations for that are going to start now <laughs> or, or will start soon. Right, right. Um, the other thing is that it really does depend on what we recommend, right? So if we recommend like a reduction in police force, there's nothing in the union contract that says you can't reduce a police force. There's nothing in the union contract that says you can't shift responsibilities and officers are no longer responsible for X, Y, and Z thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the police unions might fight, you know, those sort of changes. Um, and by might, I mean, they very much, very likely will because these are their, these are their union members <laughs> that would be either right. transitioned into other positions or be told that they were gonna lose their job at some point in the future. Um, there's also, and again, this is, this sort of depends on the causes of like where the, the pressure is, is that you know, unions can engage in what's called impact bargaining, which is, oh, wow, there's a huge substantive thing that's changed about the, the context and the conditions that the original contract were negotiated under. And a lot of that, a lot of that is like, um, budget, um, sort of like budget deficits and things like that. And they engage in impact bargaining, which says, we'll try and protect our unions by making certain concessions or changes to the expectations that we had because you know things are different from when we entered this contract. Mm -hmm. um, now those, you know, when impact bargaining is gonna be allowed or not is gonna be different. You know, Is this in response to a budget shortfall or is this in response to a change in, you know, the sort of moral perceptions and attitudes that we have. And I lean more towards that part as like what drives these changes and not the budget itself. Right. Uh, because if we, if we, if you fall on the, well, we have less money, so we have to have less officers that also translates to when you have more money, you need more officers. Right. That's right. Not the logic that we want, right? Like we don't want to say, well, just reduce the police force a little bit for a while we want to say there are substantive changes that should be made. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, there, there's a couple different options or paths um, and I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, <laughs> I don't necessarily have the exact language for when one happens versus the other or where there might be a gray overlap either. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise there's not, I don't think there's anything in there <clears throat> um, yeah, just like, yeah from just skimming it it just seems like a lot of details on like how they go about like stipends and pay uh upgrade and maternity leave and just your typical things that you would find in a contract yeah and that i mean that's a lot of what this is meant to be right mm -hmm. um some things that are interest or that are part of this is like the city of Northampton takes part with um, or is opted in for the Quinn bill, um, which is officer pay incentives based on education. Uh, I think the, the, the highest is 20% um, increase over their base salary um, for completing a master's degree in criminal justice, I believe. I don't want to quote me on that because I haven't read the entirety of the bill. Um, but the city is basically paying half of that, half of that change as well. Um, and I believe the state pays for the other half. Again, I'm not 100% sure on where the, the money comes for that second half. Um, but I believe, and again, without knowing fully, is that that's at least some of where that, um, in the Northampton Police Department, there's that $500,000-ish line of um, incentives or retention. I believe that's, that's part of that. But again, I don't know. I haven't dug deep enough into the budgets to know. 
Right. Besides the contracts, is that is there anything else uh, in terms of? I know that we're still relatively missing a good chunk of information um, to really work on. Uh, but are there any kind of questions that we want to put forward to the police chief that have recently crossed our mind, uh, or things that we feel like we might have missed after having that uh, general discussion um, with the rest of the commission? Anything that you feel like might have flown under our initial radar when thinking about what the policing budget looks like and how it functions? So I think there's one. Um, so the chief responded to us, uh, to our questions about what more can you tell us about time? Mm -hmm. And what more can you tell us about um, how you staff your the, the department? Mm -hmm. um, the first one, and I'll just share this really quickly, is... Oh, um, I went for, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to super dig in, like to confirm all of these numbers and where they relate to, but based on what the chief gave us of um, 17,000 hours of call time for 2019, um, including all of their shifts. And that was my fault. I only had the, I only had the midnight shift. I didn't realize they were labeled <laughs> by shift as well. I thought they were just aggregated by year. Um, so if we increase this, this is where that time is. Um, mm -hmm. She also mentioned that there's, um, uh, there were two trainings that, that or she said officers had like 8,000 hours of training. That's this. And then officers had um, the field training. It was officers per, um, participate in field training for probationary officers. And that's this 4,000. I don't know how much of that 4,000 is also part of like them following and responding to calls. I don't know if those are discreet or not. Um, I would assume that if you had someone doing field training that they would be out with the other officer, <laughs> you know, right. doing the work. Um, but even with all of that, <laughs> yeah, uh, we still have this chunk. Now, some of this chunk is still gonna be vacation, time off, things like that, but I'm looking at it and there's still a big chunk. Um, the other thing to note is this is even reduced. So the city budgeted for 47 patrol officers. Um, their average was 33 and a half patrol officers. Mm -hmm. um, and the chief sent a little graph that like showed where people were missing. Um, so I even adjusted the total down, um, but there's still a huge change that we just don't know. So um, this is that even after all of that has been accounted for? Uh, this does not have, um, like the vacation, vacation, vacation. right? Um, you know, uh, the chief mentioned. You know, everybody gets a half hour of lunch. That's that's human. Everyone deserves to eat. So, <laughs> right. I can do the math out and sort of guesstimate. Um, right. Guesstimate that as well, so you can put those in and within the contract. And this is why I actually started to dig a little bit today. Um, earlier was to just sort of go through what's guaranteed as like. What's the what's the accrual time um, for vacation and things? Just to estimate that as well, because the chief didn't give us that information, um, but it should exist in the contract. Again, that doesn't account for people who might have had you know years of vacation time before 2019, and then during 2019 they they took all of it. Right? I don't. Right. I don't have that kind of access to their HR, and I wouldn't want it. <laughs> um, so again, this is just a rough. These are just rough estimates. The other thing that was interesting, um, and so the, um, the police chief talked a little bit about um, how they staff. Um, and the police chief's exact wording, sorry, I had it, and then I naturally closed out of that window. Um, back to that. Here we go. Um, so she said, uh, uh, for, you know, how do you determine how many officers you need in the department? One valuable resource is the 2019 Department of Justice FBI Uni uh, Uniform Crime Report, or UCR. Um, 
It indicates that the rate of full-time officers per 1,000 inhabitants nationally is 2.3. In New England, it's 2.2. And the NPD ratio is under that at 2.08. Um, I think what is important is, especially as we're talking about patrol officer time, is to be specific. <laughs> um, but right. the so the, the UCR data um, for full-time law enforcement officers. So again, this is not just employees, it's just officers. That for the Northeast is 1.8, uh, I'm sorry, 1.9 for cities that are 25,000 um, to 49,000 for a population. If you go to the other option, and I think this is where they were pulling data from, uh, mm -hmm. just the law enforcement employees, that's where you get that 2.2. Um, but, and I think we've, we've talked about this before, but, um, and I, just talked with Lois about this is that these are these are what are these are just averages that they're not a recommendation it's not saying this is how many you should have to perform tasks it's just saying this is how many there are and so if we look at this and we know that police departments have been sort of both they've they've been built up they've been overfunded um, right to the disinvestment in other services um, so we say, okay, those are those are probably inflated, or or at least they're not they're not numbers that we want to make as the goal. They're numbers that we want to they're just numbers that tell us where we've been. Right. Um, so at this point, we have you know the sort of question of what numbers might we want to recommend that, what might we want to find or recommend to make that um, to talk about where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to shut up so that Lois can talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, these FBI recommendations or what they say, number of police per hundred per a thousand people. I mean, this is this is what the FBI standard is based on the kind of policing that we're saying we no longer want. Right. So uh, they can say whatever numbers they recommend and the chief can believe and probably does believe that this is what a police department needs because this is what they have and this is what they aspire to have. So if there are any personnel missing, then they want to fill those slots to, to come up with that average number, to meet that number. But our point is, is, in an odd way, it doesn't matter what our, my point is, it doesn't matter what that number is. Mm -hmm. What matters is, is what we think the goal of the police needs to be. And our own number, whatever that number is. And I think that going forward, a lot of cities are going to be saying no, uh, even though historically this is what the police standard is, this is not what the community standard is. If we're going to make our own community standard, which is going to mean decreasing some of the police budget, which means decreasing some of the staffing and increasing other staffing. And so, I mean, the things that, I mean, the, the things that are more interesting to me or more relevant to me, is not this and not, you know, I mean, is, is looking at those documents that ask for a sense about uh, what the police do. And I mean, so there was um, community service and there's one drugs and then there's another one supplemental something or other. I can't remember what all the categories are, but it's page after page of what they actually do. And I mean, the one that sticks in my mind Drugs, because when when I first saw it, I imagined what it was going to be was 
um, uh, people buying and selling drugs. But actually, most of it, when you scroll through it, is, are the police being asked to, um, I mean, occasionally respond to an overdose, but mostly what they're being asked to respond to is picking up dirty needles. And I mean, that to me is not what I thought of when I thought of a police function when I, of, in terms of drugs. And, and so when I think about who else can be doing these kinds of things that need to be done, I think, is this something that the police need to do? Or is this something that the people who are the syringe exchange people need to do? And can they be enlisted at whatever cost would cost to have them do that, to be the ones to go and do that, since that's what they do. They fill with dirty needles, not clean needles, but also dirty needles. And so, I mean, so just looking at these, uh, what the police are, are doing is, I mean, I hope that the police services committee are looking at these same things. But it's not just a budgetary question, it's an activity question. And I, I don't know that they are. I mean, I hope that they are because this gets to me like to the core of it. Um, and then say, you know, what functions do the police still need to do? And then we can come up with some kind of number based on what they do and what they don't need to do. Yeah, and I mean, I think some of this is also, so the documents that the police chief um, sent and that we, pro if you didn't get them, um, you might have to request access. She didn't share them, just anyone with the link, but a lot of those are supposed to be, um, so she, we'd asked for like, what is, what does this code mean um, in, in your reporting system? And so they didn't have a good answer of what it means. So they gave us examples of, of calls that were in that. And like the, what caught me, like the unknown person, I mean, the first dozen or so are just, somebody was sleeping and a police officer woke them up. Mm -hmm. um, and so those sort of things, like, is that something, you, you know, when someone says, hey, somebody's laying on the ground, <laughs> um, is that you need an armed officer to be there? I mean, what would make sense to me a lot of the, in a lot of these cases, especially in the ones where it says the, the caller didn't know if the person was breathing, that you probably want an ambulance, that you want someone, you know, that's got the equipment to handle if somebody needs to be resuscitated quickly, rather than having a police officer get there and then maybe call for an ambulance and adding those, those precious minutes. Right, right, right. And I haven't looked beyond, and like some of these are, um, some of these, when they say like an unknown person, um, you know, it was found a person sleeping on the westbound side of the road. Uh, they were found to be intoxicated and didn't want to talk to us. Um, when he walked away, sorry, and when he walked away, he was walking away. Okay. Um, monitored until he went into the lot of Leeds package store, determined to be a danger to himself and was placed into protective custody. That to me is a, an odd <laughs> series of events. Yeah. Um, but the, the rest of them, you know, things like unknown man down, um, male lying on the top of landing by the front door, callers unable to confirm breathing status. Party was asleep, party was sleeping, moved along without issue. Um, the next one, uh, a caller reporting unconscious party, female was sleeping in vehicle, was asked to leave the property. <laughs> like that's, yeah, that's the I mean, there's, there's I mean, there's, there's, I don't know what category there's in, there's a whole category, I can't remember what category, the category it is, but it's bringing CDs from the um, from the uh, call center to uh, the police station. 
each other every day, or I don't know, there's somebody that it's part of the law, you know, going there, getting this, bringing it over, going there, getting there. I mean, I don't even know how many times a day it is, but it's a police officer that does this. Um, I mean, they're just, I mean, when you actually read what is being done, uh, I mean, I'm not saying there aren't times when actually the police might need to intervene and maybe we haven't seen those yet. Uh, but in most of the ones that I've looked through, that's not what I'm seeing. It's just yeah. not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing things like picking up CDs or picking up needles or whatever, asking people who are drunk if they're, you know, need to assist their whatever you know and, and again this is this is why I hope that the services committee is is looking at these because um, I mean some of them are things that do need to get done like getting dirty needles and getting rid of them but I'm not I don't think that's that's something that the police need to do. Somebody needs to do it. And I think there is somebody, people in town that can't do it. You think that this gives us the, I mean, this is sort of what we've, we've said all along and known pretty broadly, which is that thankfully Northampton doesn't have a lot of crime. There's, there's very little sort of, and you know, crime in the sort of broad span, broad expanse of like Actual crime. Like, a, a violation of a law and you present an, an emergency situation where there's where there's clear and present danger to people involved. There's not a lot of that. Um, and it, you know, we, we aren't New York City, we don't have murders every day or every few days or what, but <laughs> and so a lot of this is sort of thinking down again, what do the police do um, with the time that, you know, with the time that we have an officer on duty, what are they doing? Um, and you know this does overlap with the the policies and services we're asking you know what do they do <laughs> how are you, how are they supposed to spend their days um but how also how do they spend their days i mean really how do they spend their days and um, and also how much does that cost to the city and again i think this is you know the chief sort of you know in in her own way is saying you know don't attribute a dollar amount to activities but i think we kind of need to because again if we're looking at what other who else can respond to someone who's probably sleeping? Or who can respond to if someone's having a, a medical emergency and how much does that cost? Um, again, I don't think it's gonna be easy. It's gonna be a particularly difficult task to sort of, um, to make sense of. Um, but I think this is also gonna be critical if we're going to say what, what money needs to leave and when and where it needs to go. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I hope that. I mean, we can say this, but I do think. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but, and I think we can make those specific recommendations. But I and I hope that the mayor would implement some of those recommendations. But I don't want to see a situation like we have now where money gets reduced from the police department and it goes to the general fund. And uh, otherwise, I don't know what we're doing, you know, or I don't know what I'm doing because that's not what I'm interested in doing. So if that's the outcome of this, that's not a satisfactory outcome for me, but also for this whole enterprise. Um, but I, you know, so I hope that we can make some recommendations, but then it won't be up to us to say, I mean, we can say it, but to implement, yes, we think this amount needs to be cut from these kinds of activities and put in this instead. And I think that's a big leap of faith that that could happen. Not to say that we won't try to do it or we won't do it, but I think the implementation of a recommendation specific, um, we'll see. 
you know, and again, I think that's why we also need to explore where the city council has power, um, you know, within the bounds of the charter or what might need to change um, within the charter, within ordinances, whatever it is, those are longer term, but what would need to change in order to empower the city council um, if they represent, you know, public opinion, public thought, public feeling and sentiment more than the legislative, or sorry, the executive branch, um, you know, uh, because there is there is sort of an imbalance in power when it comes to overseeing these matters. Um, and that's, you know, by design in the charter, but now we're finding, you know, we're, we're pushing those limits, but, you know, if we make these recommendations, we want to say, all right, here are the possible avenues forward. Like, this is what happens if you work together, and here's, you know, what each person or each group or body is, is empowered to do. And here are the ways that you can still impact this, you know, even if there is resistance from, from another branch. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, because again, we don't have, we don't have to Michael, what you, what your response to this is as a city councilor. Well, uh, I mean, I, I studied pretty well going into the budget hearings last year, what our, what our fiscal uh, responsibilities were. And it is, uh, as kind of Dan indicated, you know, we represent a smaller number of people each. I mean, obviously there's two at-large councilors that represent the whole city, but for me, you know, just my ward is, is about 3,000 people. So I should have a better connection with those 3,000 than say the mayor who has 28,000 people. Um, that's kind of the the concept, right? So, uh, to Dan's point, there there is that connection piece that's that, that is about representing the people uh, and the ideals of of the community. Um, we are, in terms of financial, uh, we are allowed to to cut from any line in the budget, but we are not allowed to add to any line in the budget. The city council is given the permission to the oversight, basically, to say this is too much for this department or for. Uh, the personnel of this department or what have you, or, or the, the vehicles of this department, if you will. And so we are, we're permitted to think about it in those terms, but, but telling the executive where the money, you know, where, you know, a place that you'd like them to spend more money uh, is not, it doesn't come with, with the, the ability to make it happen. It only comes with the ability to, to say, you know, we, we'd like to see you cut this and add it to this, uh, you know, and again, accountability comes through, uh, just being able to to be able to tell the executive this is not, you know, this what you're spending here is not what the community wants. Uh, but again, it, indicating, you know, you can indicate uh, verbally or 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 otherwise uh, what you believe the community wants. But but in terms of forcing the issue, it's it's not there in the charter right now. Mm. Uh, that's the that's the money side. And then of course the city council does also. Um, you know, create and approve ordinances for the city, uh, generally with you know with cooperation, honestly, from the executive branch. But, but it's not it, that's not a requirement by any means. Um, and uh, again, those do need to be signed off on by by the executive, uh, also. Uh, and I'm not really clear in the charter what happens if there's a disagreement there between the two branches. Um, you know, if it was a, a an ordinance where they they don't agree on it. Um, but that's that's kind of my feeling on it now is in terms of understanding what the role of the council is. Yep. You gotta love bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, I mean, to Dan, Dan mentioned that, that it's, uh, it, it seems in Northampton and, and this is the case throughout uh, Massachusetts really is it, where, where there are mayors, the mayors tend to, to wield a lot of power in the council's wield a lot less uh, until you get into uh, some of the larger cities. Uh, you know, the Springfield City Council wields more power than the Northampton City Council does from my, from my observation, you know, and then, and then, you know, I noticed that even in some of the very larger, much larger cities and in, in the urban areas, city council is a full-time job. Uh, so if, if you get elected to that, it's, it becomes your, your career. Uh, whereas for mm -hmm. the nine of us, it is, it is not our career. Um, you know, for some of them, I know that it's it's the thing that they do uh, right now. I mean, you know, Council Labarge, for instance, is retired at this point, and so Council is really she devotes so much time to it because she can. Uh, whereas, you know, there are many of us that are still working and doing this as a as a part time uh, commitment. Uh, so, mm -hmm. 
you know, again, and that, and that I think indicates some of the power uh, imbalance there that you referred to, Dan. Mm -hmm. It's, it's good to know that the city council has the ability to cut budgets. Uh, my fear is that we'll recommend both cuts and reallocation and only one of the two will happen, right? Uh, which then undermines uh, both the people's faith in what is left of the police department uh, because then it's incapable of doing those things because those, those responsibilities that we would have tried to attempt to shift somewhere else uh, will not have been created. And so that's, that's just a concern I have, I guess, personally. In terms of putting a dollar amount on, on uh, the operations of policing, I think we have to kind of look at, you know, what are, and this, again, this is partly of uh, the alternatives and the, of the other commissions as well, but, um, you know, what, is, what are the responsibilities we intend to shift away from the Northampton Police Department to hopefully new uh, organizations and uh, new infrastructure and what part of current policing does that suit? And then on top of that, after we've uh, reallocated those portions, uh, both monetarily and in terms of responsibility and accountability, uh, then to then cut the police department more, because as we've said before, we want the police to have a smaller footprint. And even uh, after they're readjusted um, patrol hours, uh, personnel hours, I mean, there's still a huge portion of that that goes unaccounted. Uh, even though we don't have all the data. Uh, and I think that's indicative of just how superfluous the current uh, staffing and models of uh, the Northampton Police Department uh, are. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think about what you've just said and, and you know, I think one of the great uh, criticisms of the council's cut, you know, vote to cut this year was that this this plan that 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 our commission uh, is working on wasn't made in advance of cutting the budget. We were, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so so to me that's something that a lot of people have have spoken with me about that they they wish that that you know I as a counselor had held off on voting to cut until this plan had been made. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think you know this this is what gives me real pause, Josie, in this entire sort of thing is if this commission makes a plan and presents the plan and it's not executed. You know, I don't know how, you know, if, if these responsibilities aren't moved, I don't know how the money gets moved uh, also. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really, to me, critical in terms of being able to, uh, you know, to, to take what this commission's doing and put it into, into use, uh, you know, has to be, you know, there has to be cooperation. And, and if there's not cooperation, then uh, I, you know, I just wonder how do we, how do we get there? You know, you know, in, in, you know, certainly the, the council would have the right to, to try to force the hand some, uh, but the community is going to, going to need to take up some of that too. And, you know, we saw the community was more than willing to do that last June. Uh, right. But, you know, we'll, I, that's, that's one of my concerns is, is taking this information, taking these suggestions and, and recommendations uh, and putting them into effect. Mm. No, but like understanding the the underlying mechanisms of our of our city council and of our, our of our mayor is actually is bringing a lot of things to my mind because, in some way, you know, I kind of understand the grievances of people who hope there was a plan in place before cutting the police budget, but at the same time, that requires uh, both the executive and the legislative branch to be on the same page and agree to the same things. And if that doesn't happen, then you just choose to sit there and like uh, kind of stalemate it out and just sit there and sit idly by. And, you know, inaction is, uh, is what fuels the status quo as it sits right now. So in that regard, I, I'm, I'm very happy that the city council moved to, to cut. Um, but now knowing that how that's how the, the, the mechanisms work, is there any way for, uh, and this might be just, just uh, you know, postulating out loud, but is there any sort of way that the mayor can cede some power in terms of the oversight of the police uh, budget and its reallocation to the city council, the ability to, to, um, to both cut and spend? Because uh, otherwise, I think that a lot of our action here will become uh, really, it'll become a very hectic place to be, especially with the uh, the turnover of a new mayor, uh, potentially this new election cycle to actually follow through on the recommendations. 
Um, I just that's just something that's on my mind. I know that's a, a, a long distance away, and we, of course we have to make the recommendations first. But I think to not consider um, the way that politics works here it would be a mistake on our part. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Absolutely. I think that's that's going to be a big part of it too. Is is uh, mm-hmm. what is what is what does this mayor choose, choose to do with what what he has basically announced is now his final budget. Um, and, and who does the city uh, choose to to put into that place to create the next four budgets? Um, right. And how does how does how do the recommendations of this commission play into that? Uh, right. You know, the, the, the basically a, a five year plan. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot to think about. In terms of, um, and so this is sort of larger, larger questions as well. But um, I think one of the things that we can also do, since we're looking at, I think the the alternatives has got their their idea pretty set in terms of what you know what they're you know what they, they they're they're really pushing for peer led responses and things like that. And so I think one of the things that that we could do as well is to start looking at how other cities sort of worked these um, worked these into their budgets, into their mm-hmm. and the process for it. Um, right. And so again, I mean, it, it, it does somewhat mean sort of looking at like what the police are reporting and what they're doing, you know, in terms of like, you know, I, they have a category in the, in their thing that's for like mental health um, and all these other calls. Um, and so, you know, if, if we're saying that we want mental health substance abuse, you know, we have those, um, but also, I mean, to Lois's point earlier, what it, if it's picking up needles, who else, you know, what other departments might do that? Um, you know, and in what, in what way would they be empowered to do that? Or, and, you know, what would they need to scale up those services? Those are things that, I, that I'm really thinking pretty hard about um, in terms of the question, because, you know, like we're, I mean, we're talking about this as though, you know, the mayor just writes out a budget and then hands it off. Um, but, you know, the, the, the departments themselves are going to be advocating for, um, for things as well, right? They're going to be coming and saying, we can do XYG, XYZ job, and this is why we need this much money. Um, and so also thinking about the ways in which we could reach out to those groups to say, right, what, what do you need? <laughs> right, right. Um, if you were going to take over this job, because, you know, a peer led response that's going to be starting off the ground, you're starting at square zero. Um, you know, not even at one, it's just at zero where they're just beginning, it's going to be a thing, but also what more, um, you know, easier investments are going to be the things that already exist. Uh, I mean, I think none of these things are going to happen magically. You know, I mean, so if there's a peer-led uh, response, those people uh, would have to be trained. The fact that they have had the lived experience is like, I don't know what percentage, but 30%, you know, and where's the other 70%? The other seventy percent comes with training, and um, I mean that. I mean when Rachel during the last meeting, I mean, you know, they're they're spending more. Every place is spending more than a year training people. So it's not like I mean the alternative people can say yes, we want to have peer led or whatever uh, responses, but it's not like there's anything now that exists that actually can do that. And, you know, there's going to take the time and it's going to be an investment. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that um, if there's a reduction in the police budget, that can go to training and um, uh, for however many people as, as a pilot program would be. And I mean, again, I'll just say this again, because I have to keep saying it. It's 
not just about mental health responses. It's about domestic violence. It's about uh, sexual violence. It's about, you know, things that ha all of the things that happen not on the street, but happen behind closed doors. And that is a lot of how I think the police are get, do get called. And I have absolute, I mean, I don't think that they're the right, right ones to, to be responding to that. I mean, to taking a deposition or to be, you know, encountering a woman who's just been raped. And um, I mean, they're not, they're not, they're not apprehending the rapist. They're dealing with the person that's been raped. And so, I mean, that's, that doesn't, that couldn't be a police function. And, um, but all of that is going to require people trained to actually do that. Yes, I mean, maybe safe passage doesn't, I'm not sure what they do in terms of these kinds of interventions actually showing up at somebody's house, um, not somebody calling and I, I don't know, I just don't know what their, what their procedures are. Um, but uh, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of this and it's, it's a lot more than uh, somebody having uh, an emotional crisis and they need respite care somewhere. And even that, expanding that would be costly. So, I mean, all of this, the training and the hiring and the, you know, all of that is, even if we do it on a very small scale in year one, is going to be money. And, uh, you know, just because I've said it 2,000 times, I'll say it 2,001 times, that, um, It's going to be up to us as the commission and people who are uh, voters in the city to make it clear to counselors and to make it clear to whoever the mayor is going to be that we don't want money that's taken out of the police budget to go to the general fund. We want it to go to these precise things that need to be done that whatever we can be up to buy as a pilot project, because I think that's the only way it's going to start, a pilot project. And I don't know how much money. I mean, is that another 10%? I just, I don't know. I mean, um, I mean, if we want the needle exchange people to pick up needles, we're going to have to pay them to do it. Uh, and, you know, and on and on. Anybody that we're going to be asking to do something in addition to the training, we're going to have to pay to do it. And I think that's, you know, we can, I mean, hopefully the alternatives people and will come up with a plan that will be possible. And we can also make recommendations from, for, you know, how much we think the budget needs to be reallocated. Um, and the services people can say, listen, these are the kinds of services that we don't think the police need to be doing and that there are people who are better, better trained to do it and do a better job at it than what's happening now. And that's, I mean, that's kind of why I'm trying to dig into like accounting for time and figuring out, you know, how much, because if you went to, let's say we go to the, the needle exchange people and we say, um, you know, we say, hey, we want you to take on this task. One of their first things is gonna be, well, how much is it, like, <laughs> how much are we doing? And so we need to know, all right, so if we're taking that responsibility away from the police department, we're putting it somewhere else, how much funding does that free up for us to then transfer along with that responsibility? Um, because, you know, we can't, I, I agree, we can't just cut without reinvestment. Um, and at the same time, we can't, uh, we can't, re we can't move those responsibilities without also putting funds where, you know, where they need to go to do it. Um, 
you know, which is going to be significant, right? Because we're not talking about making things less safe for people or just, I mean, if we talk about, you know, the 2.2 or 1.9, you know, law enforcement officers, I might not want to see 1.9 law enforcement officers, but I would want to see 1.9 people dedicated to community service um, and community Absolutely. safety. Absolutely in that sense so like i think for us it's going to be really looking at what those what these projects have cost other cities um again they're they're usually larger so even their pilots are larger than we're gonna <laughs> than i think we're gonna hit um you know but we can also look at and i don't particularly love the entire avenue but looking at you know what does this what does this save um the city in terms of of um in terms of money right so uh, if fewer people are going to places they don't need to be going to, if fewer people are being funneled into the jail, which I'm excited to get the data from the DA's office in a few days. Um, but if, there, if fewer people are, are hitting that, you know, what's the net benefit to either the state or to us? Because we've got these other interventions in place. Um, just because that's the sort of argument, I think that makes a lot of sense to people, even if it's not the best you know, from, it's not from the soul or the heart, um, but it, it makes a really good, everyone's concerned about fiscal responsibility. And we can say, look, here's this program, it'll pay for itself, um, you know, over time, or it'll, it'll reduce what we're, what we're spending on things that aren't helpful for our community anyway, uh, but it'll, it'll put that money into something else. So, you know, what happens if you, you know, if you connect someone with the right resources at the right time, um, you know, for their future trajectories and what their interaction, um, you know, exposure to harmful situations and things like that, those are all going to reduce as we get them the right care for whatever the, whatever the intervention is. Or, you know, if we stop sending people to wake up people who are asleep, <laughs> um, you know, what happens, you know, what happens there? So I think, I think we do have a tall order to sort of figure out what are the numbers that go along with all of these questions. I agree. I mean, I hope that when we get the number uh, from the DA, I mean, just deal with, I mean, I mean, it's very odd, but you're talking about the police without talking about arrests and what the consequences of arrests are is bizarre. Um, so, I mean, it would be interesting to find out uh, based on the arrest, and they don't have, they don't have a, they don't, the DA doesn't have the arrest, they have the charges. And then to see, you know, how many of the people that are arrested are actually charged. And then what the outcomes of those charges are, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, probably 95% of them will be people are in. And then what the other 5% are. I mean, 95% is how much gets to be bargained everywhere. I mean, it's not peculiar to here. So it would just be interesting to have some reality based about uh, the things that people think the police are doing and in terms of dealing with crime and what the outcome of uh, that is. Because I mean, I think that most people think that's what the police are there to do. And so it would be good for us to know what that is and what that isn't. Yeah, and the, the chief did give us the um... the arrests, um, arrest offenses for 2019. Um, so we have those, again, they're in a, they're in a, a form that's not particularly helpful or conducive to sort of looking at numbers broadly. Um, and with the caveat um, that people who are placed in protective custody all have the term drunkenness listed as their offense um, because it's not a criminal offense. <laughs> so that's another thing to think about too is 
sort of how do we view as a, as a city, what are, what are our policies and what's our understanding of how protective custody should work? Um, and sort of what does that mean for us going forward? That's like a separate section. I mean, a separate thing. I'm talking about actual fine. Mm -hmm. Fine. I was thinking about just what Lois was saying before, and, you know, Lois, I, I just want to thank you for bringing up the domestic violence and sexual violence, you know, as a concern, uh, because I, I feel like, I don't, I don't want this to sound wrong, but I'm, I feel like the mental health stuff that we've been talking about, the alternatives to addiction services and mental health services is, is, a, is a low, like the low hanging fruit, because we know there are better options for dealing with these with these emergencies uh but what you're talking about and again you the, the phrase that you use was behind closed doors uh is is a thousand percent correct and that's that's really deep work um you know it, it again this is i've said this before but i you know knowing that this uh commission is wrapping up in in you know another two months and uh change makes me think that this commission could be something that, that continues its work, maybe not in this exact configuration, but however it may may go, because this the, the community response to emergencies can can be better and it may not just be able to be done in uh, 20 weeks or whatever we've been given here. I mean, I just want to say, uh, I mean, I, I haven't even really heard uh, alternative people talking about substance use. I've only heard them focus really on one thing and that uh, mental health challenges and that's really just a fraction of what's going on here I mean there's an opioid problem in Northampton and uh, and there are That's also a function of sort of what we've been given in terms of time and and resources right like the the whole reason that we were sort of called into this the whole reason the commission exists was really centered around issues of racial justice and inequality and that's sort of fallen off and elizabeth has brought this up as well but also with respect i mean these are the things that you know scholars spend a lifetime studying <laughs> to release you know reports and then but you know the it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of it because these are hard. There's no real, there's no hard data that's going to tell us about all of the sort of microaggressions and problematic interactions. There's nothing that's tracked about those, right? Because they, they aren't continual and it's really going to be hard to find. It's hard to establish a pattern and a motive and say, okay, you know, this officer pulled over this person because they noticed they had dark skin, right? That, that's a hard argument to make, even though we know that it happens. <laughs> Um, it's a hard argument to make with data and then present back. Well, um, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I've talked about this before, you know, tracking police stops. Mm -hmm. You know, that's data. Like who, who is, who is stopped? Not who's ticketed, but who is stopped. You know, and keeping track of those. I mean, some places, if somebody is stopped and whether they're walking, or in a car and they're stopped, they get a little receipt from the police. You, you know, this is what, and the police keep a record of that. I mean, so that's a way of, of tracking uh, the person who's been stopped and also the people that 
that are doing the stopping. Um, and just back to uh, what you were saying, I, I, I think the reason that people have gotten into this is because they've responded, not, not from a, a Black Lives Matter, not to the thing that actually, but to the people who have been showing up and, and speaking in the, in the open comment period. And that those people have been focused on people on the street. And I, I mean, I'm not in any way saying that people, what's happening to people. I mean, I've been talking about what needs to be done for that. But I think that it's been driven by that instead of saying, this is the full range of what police are doing and what policing is. And, and these are the things that are going to be our top priorities. And instead, it's become this one thing. And, you know, I think as, I mean, maybe, Michael, you're right. Hopefully somebody can take over from us afterwards. But, uh, uh, you know, that there's, there's a lot more to be done because if there's a whole pie, there's only been me, like, 20% or something that's gotten the attention that it needs to get. And then the 80% is still out there. Mm, and I mean, so hopefully that will happen, you know, as part, it's not going to happen between now and when we're done, but it needs to be discussed at least for the future. Yeah. And I think when we, when we issue our, our final report, which is coming up soon, um, that there has to be a sort of, you know, we recognize either, these are the things that we've been able to look at thoroughly, but, you know, for whatever, whatever iteration happens, if it's just part of, you know, a yearly review or whatever it is that we recommend a, um, that we have a process, you know, that we say, these are the things that need to be looked at. Here are the milestones and timelines for them in addition to sort of already doing what we're saying, but I'm, at least for myself, I'm, just, I'm imagining it, that this is an iterative process that happens. I don't see it as, because as you said, you know, if we make our recommendations, there's nothing uh, that's gonna compel anyone to do anything about them. But even if they did, year one is year one, but there's, there's more years, you know, when we're talking about these plans and if we talk about, here's a pilot, but we need to lay out what are the next steps? You know, how do you, you know, and it could be sort of defining you know, what is success in a pilot? And so broadly, like, or just establishing, like, you know, make sure that, you know, part of this pro part of this pilot process is, you know, you need to keep track of what you're doing so that you can come back and say, yes, it's effective. Here are the people we're helping and in mm -hmm. these particular ways. Um, and so establishing that and saying, right, if you meet those criteria, well, now we're ready to scale up, right? Just like any pilot program, but sort of pushing those, pushing those, but also saying we have, we have ideas for where to explore for, um, you know, domestic violence, which gets really, really tricky and really difficult to sort of get people out of the mindset of you have to have a police officer there. Um, you know, if we're talking about rape or sexual assault, right? Like we know that police officer, you know, police departments across the country have shown that this is not, <laughs> particularly something that they they consider really priority, right? Um, in terms of like slow testing, in terms of victims sort of be re-traumatized by their interactions. Um, but again, and I'll, I'll throw in the race part is that, you know, how do you, how do you get <laughs> a department that is so, and not Northampton specifically, but an institution like the police in the US that's so ingrained with racial violence, how do you get the officers who have existed within that system, who exist within the policies that were created and were drawn to that system, how do you get them to a point where you know, there's equality and justice and that there's, there's fairness in the treatment, right? Um, you know, and that's even the interpersonal thing. So the things that are never gonna be tracked, right? So, so I'll give my own experience of watching an officer approach with their hand on their weapon, like that's, even if they came up to me and said, hey, you were jaywalking or you were uh, stumbling and we thought you were intoxicated, you were sleeping on the side of the road, whatever it is, there's nothing that's gonna say, oh, and I touched my gun too, <laughs> right? Like those, those things. So, I mean, this is gonna be a part of it and that's a cultural thing, right? They might not even be aware that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. 
but also we need to recommend more than implicit bias training because we know that even the person who started implicit bias training said it works for about 15 minutes after a three hour training. <laughs> yeah. And if people are there and they're not open to it, it actually increases their bias <laughs> by the end right. of it. And so, you know, sort of thinking about what, what can we do to still systematically address those issues that are very difficult. And I don't think we're gonna do it in, you know, the next two months. I don't think we could do it in the next five years really meaningfully, um, but to establish and push that, that that's something that we still want and something that we value as a community. Um, so thinking about like, you know, next steps and, and defining them. No, absolutely. And kind of like how you pointed to it, how, how everyone here has kind of pointed to it is that like a lot of the stuff isn't being, uh, you know, recorded. Uh, like none of this is, none of the police aren't being accounted for any of this. And if, uh, if a citizen wanted to file a complaint, uh, they, it, they'd have to somehow prove that the police was doing something uh, essentially illegal or breaking the, the, the laws themselves before it is even uh, inserted as like uh, a complaint or whatnot. Um, on top of that, like we are talking about establishing these pilot programs, which absolutely should happen, and how we have, and we're looking at what are the metrics of success for these pilot programs, but we never ask, what are the metrics for success for policing? You know, we never ask the police to ever produce any meaningful data that suggests that what they're doing is actually uh, benefiting the community in the way that people just assume that it is, even though we have empirical data that says otherwise, even though we have anecdotal data that says otherwise. Um, and so I think part of our, our charter is to definitely hold the police, uh, what, whatever is left of them, either by the end of this commission or by the end of uh, a year's long transitional period, like what does accountability look like? Because uh, what we have right now is certainly not it. So for next steps, <laughs> um, I'm going to keep plugging at the data that we got from the chief, at least to, to still account for their sick time and things like that. Um, you know, but at the same time, uh, I know I don't have the bandwidth to also dig into contracts and dig into um, like the costs associated with other, other groups that have done this. Um, which I think are important. Um, I'm going to leave that with, does anybody, or does any, or I just want to know what other people think our next step should be or where we should be focusing. I think, I think definitely uh, coming up with some sort of pricing model for what these alternatives might cost based off of what other municipalities have done. Uh, and also what we might want to enact ourselves is definitely something worth looking into. Um, it's hard to push for anything meaningful if we don't actually have the, the capital to back it up. Uh, so I think that's definitely something that we should, we should push toward doing. I agree. I agree. And I, uh, that's something that I think uh, I would be, would be very interested in, in, uh, in working on. It just the, uh, what you had said earlier, uh, Dan, uh, how, how have other cities placed this, um, you know, uh, into their budgets? You know, how does it, how does it get rolled out? Um, Rachel sent a list of the, like the small, I mean, I, I know she said Olympia, but if there, if there were other cities that contact information that were smaller cities uh, to, um, you know, be in touch with them to see how they did the, the budgeting part. I mean, I didn't see, were you the person in touch with her, Dan? I don't, I don't know where she appeared from. Yeah, um, I had reached out after she did, um, there were some folks that attended a presentation that she gave um, to a sort of international audience on on the it's very similar to what she gave us in terms of the work that she's been doing. I can reach out and ask um, if she has some other ideas of smaller towns and what what the, what their programs were called, just so we can start to look at that as well. Well, and maybe a contact person. Yeah. 
to not just like what the town was, but like who might be, you know, who would be a contact person to talk to about how they dealt with the budget. I mean, maybe there's a completely different um, way that the budget of the city has dealt with, but at least to find out how they, what they did would be interesting. Yeah. She said Olympia as a smaller city, but other than that, I mean, you see it as a pretty small city, but I, I guess uh, what they did was so long ago, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it was like if they started 30 years ago or whatever. So, uh, but, you know, something more recent, maybe be in touch with some of those people. We could divide them. There's a few of them. We could divide them up and have a set of questions or something. Yeah, that's that's a that's something I can reach out to and ask about. Maybe we can. Um, I know it'll be within the the full commission next Tuesday, but maybe our subcommittee could take a few minutes just to to put the questions together, and that might be interesting to see what the other uh, folks on the commission might want to add to that. We could maybe create our list of questions next week. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. And I like the idea of, of kind of dividing it up. I think, you know, that would be great. I'd, I'd be more than happy to take a good share. <laughs> oh, Josie's the host. Yeah, I'd, be, that well, I'd, I'd be glad to call somebody uh -huh. in some city and have a conversation about what they did. Things are only going to go downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm also looking forward to the VA information. Yeah. Um, do you remember when we had that, ex that very long, large pub public uh, comment uh, meeting where we had like four hours worth of people talking? Uh, I have it right here. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Uh, I can look it up quickly. I wasn't. I was. I wasn't asking for the date of when it happened. I was just wondering if, if the us the, is that something that we're interested in doing again. I'm pretty sure we have to do three. Yeah, right? we have. We have two more. It's. Um. It'll be on the agenda. Um. To discuss, and it's something that the outreach um, subcommittee is going to sort of talk about as well. Just because it's been, you know, sort of like how do we make it more accessible to people who aren't available just in the evenings, what's required of us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we right. don't have to have we don't have to have the entire commission available um, for those meetings, but ideally we would have, you know, most people just because right. there is a there is an impact to hearing something, you know, directly from the people. Absolutely. Uh, so um, but trying to think of like can you can that be scheduled on a Saturday? or is there another time during the week um, that would work? And um, we're, we'll be reaching out to a few folks. Um, you know, we discussed this in the, in the meeting that we'll reach out to a few organizations um, this week and hopefully you know, touch base with them early next week to say, you know, if, you know, if we wanted to include your constituents in these sort of things, what would be a good time you know, for you to orchestrate that? And if so, how and, and those sort of things to take those into account too. But we do have to have at least two more. We are not limited to just two. We could have more than that um, as well. The, the only reason I bring it up is because I think it'd be meaningful to have one um, soon after our preliminary. Uh, hopefully some people have read it. Uh, some people are kind of educated, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who have a lot of opinions of the things you've said over the last few months. But that was just something that was on my mind. Right. Um, 
guess the question is, do we have anything else to go over? Um, I don't believe there's anything else on the agenda per se. Uh, but I think, um, let me just pull it up real quick, just make sure. Yeah, that's it. I think that is it. Um, that being said, I think uh, we have some pretty meaningful next steps. Uh, I mean, I will say that I am new to the prospect of breaking down contracts, uh, but I can look into the Northampton Police Department contracts, at least what is available, uh, and see if there's anything um, that might be a hindrance to our goal of reimagining or anything meaningful that we can uh, kind of talk about in terms of negotiating in the future. I think that could be, uh, that could be meaningful. And one thing is that the union contract also pretty specifically states what uh, sort of what areas over the police department and personnel management that the city has. So I think really understanding sort of what that, like what those sort of management duties or roles um, as held by the city is going to be useful as well, just to know. I think it's like right in the start. Um, it's been a while since I've like really, really dug in there. But. <laughs> so where is that? Um, there's a copy in the shared drive. And oh, in, the okay. chat, um, in the chat, I also posted the, oh no, I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, I'll post this um, just so everyone has the link as well so that this is the collective bargaining agreements and it's all across the city. So you can also, so, you know, one thing we could do is, you know, in someone's abundance of spare time, look at the police, <laughs> <laughs> the police contracts and also some of like just skimming on um, some of the other, um, the other ones just to, to know what's the difference between, um, What's the difference between the, the different um, contracts that exist within the city? And right. Hi, Namdi. I know you think your subcommittee is also meeting, but in a different Zoom. I don't know if you meant to join us or not. I made a mistake. I'll get the other link. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Take it easy. I figure that happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for a second, I was like, oh man, another commissioner coming in to check out the, the spending and subcommittee. <laughs> and I was, because I've sat in on a couple of the other ones. I've like stopped in for a minute to see, but I don't think I've ever seen someone else jump come to ours. Not yet. <laughs> because the they get all the, the glamorous things. side. They get all the <laughs> topics and, and we're, I think, still, you know, we're still fun, but in a different way. <laughs> I mean, we're essentially the vanguard. Nothing happens unless the money moves, you know? I like it. Um, sorry, I was gonna say, uh, Dan, you you said a bunch of words about uh, the, the responsibilities of the uh, city in terms of the policing contracts. And you said all those words and I know all of them individually. I just don't know them in that order. So could you could you clarify just a little bit? Um, just, um, in the police union contract, um, there's a section of basically what the city is responsible for um, in terms of management for personnel. And I can actually, I have it up now that I went to find it again. Um, I also have the collective bargaining thing up if you just want to tell me what page it's on so I can read along. Oh yeah, um, so are you in the um, the uh, officers? Because there's two different police contracts. Uh, uh, I, I, was on, I was on the patrol contract 19 to 22. Sure. Are you looking at the MLA? Uh, so the, yeah, so the police, uh, sorry, let me be sure. So yeah, the police patrol MOA. Okay, that's open now. Um, no, I'm sorry. So it's oh, the police, the the first one, the, um, okay. the actual contract. Okay, yeah. I was about to say that one seems pretty short for only being three pages. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 
um, right at the so on page two of that contract is the management rights. Um, so like um, so by way of example, but not limit but not limitation management retains the following rights to determine the mission, budget, and policy of the Northampton Police Department, to determine the organization of the department, the number of employees, the work functions, and the technology of performing them, to determine the numbers, types, and grades of positions of employees assigned to the organizational unit, work project, or to any location, task, vehicle, building, station, or facility, to determine the methods, means, and personnel by which the department operations are to be carried, to manage and direct employees of the department, and it goes on. There's a whole bunch of bullet points yeah, yeah, yeah i see it i don't want to spend the next five hours no, no, of course not of course not but really understanding what what those sort of things mean like what mm -hmm. you know where does the city have power <laughs> in yeah. relation to the police union because i think this is going to be a tension that we have to sort of at least acknowledge as well um to say that you know the police unions are not going to be happy understandably they're unions trying to represent their members um you know, so if you if you make a recommendation that might reduce their staff, even if they might, you know, even if individual police officers might agree, yeah, we shouldn't be responding to X Y Z call. Um, you know, think programmatically, you're going to have a fight when you say, okay, well, if you don't respond to those, we're going to reduce your, you know, reduce the number of personnel because you don't need that, or we're going to reduce the number of cars that you have available because you don't need 15 cars, <laughs> uh, or whatever it is. Um, right to say, you know, if you have, you know, if you have five officers on duty, you, you don't need 15 cars, you need five cars. <laughs> um, right. If that's the standard that you're, that you're using, if it's more than that, maybe there's more. Um, so again, there's, there's a lot, but we just want to make sure that we know what the city can do and where its power is and, you know, what the city can't do, um, or at least where there'll be you know, uh, will it be required sort of, you know, the lawyers are going to get involved for both sides or, um, you know, there might be litigation. So like, what, <laughs> what can we do? And what can we do to make sure that litigation is the last sort of step and that we, we recommend processes that are in line with the contract that exists and to say, you know, so in, a, in, you know, several months when they're starting the negotiations, the next time, all right, this is where the city can go or needs to go. Um, Right. So the are like we want this this clause added um, if we want something about accountability um, or transparency as part of that union contract as well. Absolutely. Uh, if this is a guiding document for for the way that the city and the unions interact, um, where does that go? How does it go? And I mean, there's going to be all sorts of legalese that has to be taken into account. And again, I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> um, but to at least put that out as a process of these are the these are the topics and explain what those topics are that we want added so right. that somebody else can hash it out <laughs> mm -hmm. um, exactly and you know as, as some of the interesting to see what the new policing bill uh, at the state level does to the contract as well yeah uh, that's going to change some of the things there too yeah, yeah. In, the, in the part that you're talking about and i think one of the things is that you know, we can always look to the state as the minimum, but I think we should mm -hmm. we should also say we want more or we want better. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if there's no other business, I'm gonna move to adjourn. <laughs> uh, sec second. Uh, does anyone want to discuss uh, potentially not adjourning? No. <laughs> okay. I'm going to catch Cynthia's update on domestic violence too in the other meeting. Yeah. Um, since um, mm -hmm. I had to step away, um, I guess I'll, I'll call us out. So uh, Lois yeah. and myself, Dan, yes. Michael? Yes. And Josie? Yes. All right. Motion passes. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So, so meeting adjourned. Take it Thanks. easy, everyone. Have a good night, everybody. See you soon.